The church without Christ is that church where the blind don't see and the lame don't walk and what's dead stays that way. There was no fall because there was nothing to fall from and no redemption because there was no fall and no judgment because there wasn't the first two. There are all kinds of truth, your truth and somebody else's, but behind them all, there's only one truth, and that is that there's no truth. You needn't look at the sky because it's not going to open up and show no place behind it. You needn't search for any hole in the ground to look through into somewhere else. You can't go neither forwards nor backwards into your daddy's time, nor your children's if you have them. In yourself right now is the only place you've got. Jesus was a liar. That's all that matters. And what the world needs is a new Jesus, whose blood isn't fouled with redemption, who nobody has to believe in. Hey, this is Eric. And this is Nick. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast, where today we're talking about Flannery O'Connor's wise blood. And joining us is the author of When Mystical Creatures Attack, Kathleen Founds. Kathleen, thanks for joining. Hi, it's great to be here, Nick. So, darkness, nihilism, discuss. So, uh, Flannery O'Connor, in her essays, states that nihilism is the air we breathe. Nihilism used to be kind of like this epiphany at the end of stories or books, but that's old news. Now, <laughs> nihilism is the starting point. I like so uh, do y'all think that nihilism is the ethos of our time, the air we breathe, what surrounds us all? I mean, absolutely. That's why I have a lot of black t-shirts, one of which I'm wearing right now. Excellent. I'm um, also wearing a black t-shirt uh, for so the record. Two out of three of us properly uh, attired for today's yeah. recording. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Eric. Uh, I'm also wearing a black beret and smoking a cigarette. That's true. Just, uh, just for the knowledge. <laughs> My shirt is listening. appropriately gray today. Yeah. So okay. also also relevant. Okay. So all right, that all checks out. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to not uh, feel some nice resonance with how bleak a lot of this is. Right. Kind of in a bit of a, an interesting time in the modern period, um, and I think that's what makes this kind of so compelling. Is it's so it's so intense. It's so drastic. The the decisions in here are life and death, and it's it's really about trying to pursue that, but in sort of a, a curious, odd, somewhat humorous, somewhat backwards way, because we have a character who's not trying to find Christ, but rather trying to lose Christ. Mm -hmm. And the ways he goes about that, um, again, are relatively jarring, especially coming from the writer of a devout Catholic background. Mm -hmm. So how do we start yeah. to unpack that? Um, well, before we move to that, I just want to state anytime someone says there's no truth, there's just my truth and your truth, and behind that, the one truth that there is no truth, I think that makes us all think of Kellyanne Conway, <laughs> uh, which shows that this book is still relevant Yeah. after all these years. There's some future stuff. Yeah. And in one of her le uh, letters, Flannery O'Connor says that um, a reviewer called her a backwoods nihilist, and really she identifies as a backwoods Thomist, T-H-O-M-I-S-T, uh, referring to her dedication to Thomas Aquinas, who she read every night before going to bed. And for those of us who are not as well-versed in Thomas's work. Um, do you want to summarize what that was about? So Thomas Aquinas is a Catholic saint. I actually don't know the specifics yeah. of but his it, sainthood. It, he's a Catholic saint, so yeah. it's a bit strict. Catholicism in a very specific sort of yeah. aff affinity, for lack of a yes. better word. Yes, and a, a saint from the era where 
there was truth with a capital T and uh, morality and right and wrong. So that indicates that Flannery O'Connor's belief system was the opposite of nihilism. That's the attraction of this this work for me is that usually I think in literature the nihilism comes from a very deliberate anti-religious stance, correct? Mm -hmm, Definitely. And what's so interesting about O'Connor's approach is that she's trying to do exactly the opposite. She's trying to show it to you as a way to pull you away from Mm -hmm. it. And it's really (laughs) interesting. I just said it. Um, It's very timely that we're reading this because – there's an argument to be made that we are at a crazy end game mm-hmm. for everybody has their own truth right now. Right. And O'Connor making this argument to come back to a, a structure that mm-hmm. she believes in, I wouldn't say it has some appeal, but I think it should at least be interrogated and in maybe in a much more welcome way than those of us living in a very secular um, world, at least, you know, the three of us in a coastal city in California. As coastal elites. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You said it, not me. Um, I I think it opens up a really interesting line of inquiry, um, both on a personal level and here. I I found myself very much um, intrigued by this even though I think the, the, the book itself and its treatment of the character is very extreme, I think O'Connor's presentation of religion and what she finds to be important and attractive about it is a much more nuanced take than I think we're used to hearing in this day and age, even if you have to dig a little bit more for it. Sure. Uh, she wrote that Her stories and books were for uh, atheists and casual nihilists and people who uh, think the question of Christ is irrelevant to daily life and that religion, you know, is maybe acceptable as a symbol or a metaphor or um, just this self-improvement program. Uh, So she wrote for... uh, modern folks. So she has the quote where she talks about needing to write outside of your own audience and having to amplify in order to have that be listened to, to have it be understood. And that's where a lot of that sort of the grotesque comes from, right? And I wanted to pull, uh, Kathleen, you had found this, but I've got it up. So the original quote from the New York Times book review when the book came out, and the last paragraph of this is is pretty fantastic. And it's talking about the tone and, and kind of what she puts down. And so they write, In such a world, all living things have vanished, and what remains exists in a redemptionless clashing of unending vengeance, alienated from any source of understanding, the absence of which does not even define a world of darkness, not even that, for there has been no light to take away. So you have this possible, you know, 1950s coastal elite secular person interpreting this as the most bleak thing. But what Flannery O'Connor is actually putting down is that it's actually kind of the opposite. Right. Well, she's starting where her readers are. I took a class in college, um, which was called From Religion Through Philosophy to Literature. And the idea is that we used to have religion and the world was full of mystery and meaning and We had saints and God spoke to people. And then we developed philosophy. And philosophy looked for meaning through a more logical and rational approach. Uh, But then we realized there's no such thing as truth. And that's the only truth there is. And so now we just have literature. We have stories that give us meaning and show different ways to live. But we must conclude that there is no better way to live. And one way to live is no better than another way to live. And of course, uh, you know, coming from a Catholic high school, I raised my hand and said, okay, so are you saying that someone who tortures cats in their spare time 
is living in a way that is uh, equal to Mother Teresa. Like, you can't say one of those ways to live is better. And uh, <laughs> the professor was like, yeah, that's that's where we're at in terms of life. <sighs> and I would argue that that philosophy has led us to where we are today. Right. That philosophy has seeped into the mainstream. And it is why Kellyanne Conway can say alternative facts. And so, of course, all those folks, you know, progressives who are perhaps in that audience that Flannery O'Connor wrote for, um, who don't believe in necessarily God or truth with a capital T, uh, we are horrified by the nihilism that is now mainstream. Yeah. I, I mean, it's you could make the argument that it's also sort of postmodernism gone amok too, right? If you really want to swing it back to, it's easy to kind of go to who we see as the enemy or whatever and say they're really manipulating this. But there's an argument to be made that it happens on all sides, right? That we've all sort of taken this opportunity you know, right. to, you know, manufacture our all our own truths. And I think it's very easy for anybody on any part of that spectrum to go too far with it. And it presents a really difficult path to navigate the world. And so I'm not saying I would want to go back to religion, but you could see how people was presented with so many facets and so many lenses in which to look at the world are thinking, I'm just going to pick one now and stick with that just because it yeah. It alleviates it stress it in my life. Right. Right. And O'Connor saying, hey, Catholicism, not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we talk about the bubbles that we stay in where we each have our own unchallenged truth. Right. And so to tie that back to sort of Flannery O'Connor's response to sort of these early reviews and these secular viewpoints. Uh, at least the copy I have kind of has a, a new forward by the author that was written about 10 years after the, the book's being published. And so she goes on to say, that belief in Christ is to some a matter of life and death has been a stumbling block for readers who would prefer to think that it a matter of no great consequence. For them, Hazel Motes's integrity lies in his trying with such vigor to get rid of the ragged figure who moves from tree to tree in the back of his mind. For the author, Hazel's integrity lies in his not being able to. And so that's exactly it. That's checking it from the other side. I mean, what I really like about O'Connor is that she's, when you understand what she, what her what her purpose is behind a lot of her writing, which goes back to this religious fervor. I have to say, I appreciate the nuance in which she brings to the you know, the doubt, the idea of questioning that that religion is not the zero sum thing, but it's a constant sort of um, battle in which to have faith. Right. And I think that that has been so drained from any discussion that we have around religion. And I to, just a one sort of anecdote that I thought about a lot during this book was there's a rabbi down at Stanford that runs the, the services every, you know, every other week or whatever her rotation is down there. And, I, and she's married to a scientist. And somebody asked her flat out. You know, how do you reconcile the fact that you're married to a scientist? You know, and you're you're a rabbi who's all about religion. And she just said, to me, religion is about my own internal struggle, the questions I have internally about who I am as a person. Science is, you know, concerned with the external world in which I operate, the corporeal world, so to speak. And that's how I negotiate it. And I feel like that sort of discussion is is so non-existent in our everyday life. I just feel like we've as a society now have bifurcated into this almost evangelical religious world and this arguably evangelical secular world. And there are people that live in the middle, but their voices are not being heard or amplified. And that's what's ref that's what I think is very timely about O'Connor's work is that she at least is trying to attack this evangelism that she has for Catholicism in a way that at least feels a bit nuanced. Even if the narrative itself of this book feels rather extreme, I think the ideas that she's presenting have a degree of 
you know, nuance in which they're sort of seeded through this book. For me, anyway, in comparison yeah. to the discussions that I usually hear around this topic. Yeah, that's that's your truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so I, I guess question back on that, that wonderful topic of nihilism. So main character, Hazel Motes. We have, uh, I guess he's a war veteran, and he's kind of floating. He ends up in a city, becomes sort of an anti-preacher. Um, do we do we consider him to be a nihilist? Yeah, he's a backwoods nihilist. <laughs> Zero sum on that one, buddy. Yeah. He's pretty 100%, I would say. So let's talk about the actual path that he goes through, right? And we'll, we'll end up in trying to unpack the slightly heavy-handed symbolism of, of the end and, and all that. But is there any progress with him as a character? Is it just nihilism front to back? Is there any level of depth and development? Is well, he a tool? That has to do with the ending, right? Um, at the end, he feels guilty and he is no longer sure of what he believes. That's, that's the progress. So he's not a Christian in the end he's just he just realizes uh maybe he doesn't know so i guess pulling it back into kind of the standard flannery o'connor structure and we can talk about her short stories versus her novels and that that very typical moment of grace that she uses right which we have kind of a, a story that's very um very literal in a way it's very direct the action is real but then there's always this point at which something shifts, and it's also very unexpected. And a lot of times she writes that she wasn't even sure that it was going to happen itself. So I mm -hmm. guess because we've kind of already meandered towards the ending, we have that point where Hazel has made his arc. He's become sort of this, this preacher figure for the church without Christ. He's, he's trying to lose his religion in any way through uh, seeing prostitutes, through um, manipulation of underage women, um, basically a whole collection of things that he's been told not to do, such that he seeks out to do them, right? Yeah. Um, but then there's this moment where when the other guy, the other entertainer, starts to steal his sort of shtick and hires a, a fake version of him, kind of pushes him over to the limit. He ends up murdering the version of himself, and then he's driving down a road, and a police officer pulls him over. And so let's like let's talk through those events. Okay. So yeah, uh Hazel Motes gets real mad at uh this guy who is preaching a bastardization of his Jesus with a lowercase J gospel and uh yeah, runs him over. And this um this man he runs over, as he is dying, makes a confession to Hazel Motes and cries out to Jesus with a capital J. Uh, that's not when Hazel Motes has his moment of grace. That doesn't happen until he is driving away from the town in his car, which Flannery O'Connor tells us is a metaphor for his hearse, for death, and also for escape, his means of escape. And then when a policeman strangely uh, pushes his car off a cliff. It could happen to anyone. Uh, instead of giving him a ticket, <laughs> which kind of seemed like mm. Flannery O'Connor just needed that to happen because um, that's pretty random uh, turn of events. And Hazel Moat sees his car at the bottom of the ravine. That's the moment he's like, yeah, I'm going to walk home now and blind myself with quicklime in order to represent that truly I've been blind and I don't know anything. That's the moment of grace. That's the moment of grace. Well, two things come to mind there. One is that the police in the South do have a especially in that period, a very bad reputation. <laughs> so, I, They're always pushing cars yeah. off cliffs. That's uh, what they're know. known for. So first off, Hazel <laughs> said they didn't have a license, and then the police officer pushed the car over and said, yeah. now you don't need a license. Yeah. So yeah. again, it's your viewpoint coming from your own sort of whatever background that you didn't think it was a benefit. So, but proceed. Mm -hmm. 
Well, also, too, I think the car is also, we talked about bubbles earlier. It's also his bubble, right? It's sort of this mm-hmm. this place for him to in, 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 in caps, uh, you know, enshrine himself within a, you know, shield of his own sort of belief system and what he believes in. And I, I think what's interesting about the moment that he runs over, you know, his sort of proxy when he refuses, you know, to to play along with um, the game of the other preacher, it brings up this idea of, you know, if nihilism is really about this idea that I don't believe, I mean, what is the, the, the textbook dictionary? I don't believe in anything. Is that really what the textbook definition of nihilism is? Yeah. In you know? the big Lebowski, there's yeah. these German nihilist characters right. and they mm-hmm. say, we believe in nothing Lebowski, except in a German accent. Yeah, I guess that belief system allows you to go to that. Arguably, I think what O'Connor's arguing is that without that, you can you can go to these extremes, and it's not an aberration, right? To run over the guy who, you know, assumed this role that I found to be so false and so horrible, you know, running him over can seem almost like a logical course of action, right? Right, and so destroying the bubble, I think, symbolically, is where the moment sort of crashes down on him because he, even if, even though he killed this guy with the car he was still in the car symbolically in his little mm-hmm. bubble and so that made that act since this person was outside my truth and outside you know what i believe to be you know right for lack of a better description and so you know is the best <laughs> plot device especially you know for you the the fiction writer i'm guessing no but from a logic standpoint well, i guess saying, it, um, it does it it's could the be the policeman pushing the car off the, the policeman cliff. part yeah that yeah. seems like the authorial hand yeah. coming in and yeah being like well something like this gotta happen well, we gotta wrap this up yeah right gotta wrap this up <laughs> it's uh been going on a long time really been stretching out this story and I would add that I think this would have been just as good, if not better, as a short story. Well, that's something that I am curious about because that's the the flaw of this thing for me is it felt a little lumpy. It felt a little like a lot of these sort of pieces kind of shoved together a little bit uncomfortably to kind of stretch to a novel. I agree. Yeah. Uh, And it's because she took a bunch of short stories and mashed them into a novel. Right. And you can actually see some of them get a little bit tweaked to fit Mm -hmm. that sort of moral underpinning that she's looking for. And get worse. I read um, the – so the first three chapters is just Hazel Motes by himself, and he's a miserable person to be in. He's just basically a jerk to everyone, and the only thing he says to anyone is, I wouldn't want to be redeemed if you were redeemed – and right. uh, there's no Jesus. That's just his interaction with everyone. So it gets a little repetitive. And then there's no humor in those first three chapters. And the thing is, Flannery O'Connor is so funny. Super funny. She that is. is where the joy and delight in reading her comes from. That's why we can hang with these awful people she writes about. And so we don't have that. And so, you know, if I hadn't been doing this podcast, I would have not continued reading oh. that book. Because it was just repetitive and there was no delight or fun in it. Because with Flannery O'Connor, you know what's coming. You know some horrible person is going to have their false self humiliated and that will make room for the Holy Spirit to come in and uh, give them that moment of grace. So we all know that's coming. So uh, we can hang with a short story, um, but then an entire novel. Yeah, just like, come on, get to the point. (laughs) We know where you're going with this. Well, I mean, certainly I feel like there's a there's a much there's much more mastery in the short stories that that really make up the, the sort of the work that we celebrate her for. The ones that come after, especially after this novel, I think, absolutely. Um, again, I, I I wasn't as versed in O'Connor before I read this book, other than 
three or four short stories. So I think that I came at it maybe a little less in a comparative sort of state. Um, but maybe the discussion too is I think what carried me through it is I still think her very distinctive voice for me is what carried me through it is that she has this just really, um, you know, it, it's a voice that feels super unique to me, even whatever the 50, 60, 70 years on since this book was published. And, um, and that's what carried me through it, even though I agree, I just felt like it was this very lumpy sort of construction of episodic and, but there were moments of both the language and I think you mentioned, um, the gorilla suit episode with Enoch. Yeah, it was this very sort of oddly moving moment in the book that felt very out of place, but not unwanted as a reader. So, um, I don't know, Nick, how do you feel about, where do you stand on that? So that one's a really good example because it, in its short story form is completely contained. Absolutely. Right. In the novel form, it gets broken up and it gets yeah. in, adds in extra little details about him carrying the lowercase Jesus. And then it splits it over the two chapters and it sort of, it sort of feels like another oddity, but in its entirety, you get this sort of start to finish moment that has the, the classic O'Connor violence in it, right? But it also has this weird, little uncomfortable not confident figure who's going to basically an event made for children and then gets very nervous and then overreacts and then schemes to come up with a plan. Yeah. It's this great uh, little character portrait of a very right. creepy, very, very odd yeah, dude. dude. But yeah. when it starts to finish, it, it makes a ton of sense. Um, So we should probably just tell the listeners what the story is about. So Enoch goes to a movie theater and he's intimidated by this gorilla character and feels this kind of competitiveness with the gorilla character. And when he hears that the gorilla character is coming to make an appearance and shake hands with children, Enoch is like, yeah, this is my chance to tell this gorilla off and put this gorilla in his place. <laughs> but then when Enoch actually shake, shakes hands with the gorilla – the gorilla's hand is really soft and gentle and Enoch is touched and opened up and he introduces himself and it's because it's the first hand that has been extended to him since he's been in that town. Um, right. And then... I got a little of a clumped in that yeah, moment. Yeah. <laughs> I admit. <clears throat> right. And then yeah. after he opens up and has this moment, um, the man in the gorilla suit, because, of course, it's not a real gorilla, says, go to hell. And then he's ashamed and feels terrible. And then he finds out the gorilla is going to make another appearance. So then he sneaks into the gorilla truck, uh, possibly murders, possibly just bops over the head. The man in the gorilla suit steals the gorilla suit, goes into the woods, buries his own clothes in a hole, puts on the gorilla suit, beats his chest, and walks over to where a man and woman are sitting on a bench gazing at the city. And Enoch extends his hand to them, and they run away screaming. And then Enoch in the gorilla suit sits on the bench and looks out at the city. So it's it's a hilarious and story. Scene. It's perfect um, itself as a short story. But then it's mashed into this novel, mm -hmm. spread out, and watered down. So if you don't want to read this novel after you've heard us uh, criticizing <laughs> it, definitely go read Enoch and the Gorilla. Uh, that's funny. I think this is the most critical we've been of a book in a while. Yeah, and it bums me out because, of course, uh, since this podcast is based on a lot of classic and revered literature, mostly white men, um, but you have broken in with some writers of color and Flannery O'Connor, who is usually the token woman um, on lists of the best books ever. So, uh, you know, I feel kind of bad 
just criticizing her. <laughs> uh, but I will say, she's a genius. She's one of the best writers ever. She's brilliant. Um, and she wrote this book when she was young. So this is her early work. And her later work is spectacular. And if you haven't read it, you should. Yeah, I just want to put that out there. I was talking to my husband about this concern. And I was saying, you know, sometimes when people on the internet critique a beloved figure, then the trolls come out and they, you know, dox that critic and Mm -hmm. ruin their life. And then my husband said, oh, don't worry, because you're criticizing a woman and no one on the internet has any problems with that. Nobody will protect that, that we don't have no, those no, trolls. No yet. one cares if you uh, critique a woman. You know, if you're critiquing a beloved male writer. Especially a beloved genre, male writer of genre of some sort, I'm guessing, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also, it's not like there's a big team of Flannery O'Connor uh, trolls on the internet. There's only one ready, way to find out, and it's this podcast, apparently. Her. Yeah. Well, I also think it would be disappointing, too, if people didn't read it because it's it's pretty – in terms of you know the times and how she writes about the South and the language in which she writes it, it's, you know, it's, it's not exactly the most you know, PC language in a 2019 era. And it would be sad if it got sort of swept up in you know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about now because of that. Because I think the, if you can get past a lot of the, the rough part of, like, the South, right, and how people talked, um, yeah, like you said, it's amazing. It's amazing work. Right. But I would say read her short stories first. How do you feel about Violent Bear It Away? Haven't read it. Uh, okay. No one made me go on a podcast. <laughs> And talk about it. Uh, you'll be back next week. <laughs> no. For future homework assignments. No. When I heard that you already did her short stories, I was like, why? <laughs> why? Why do I have to do this book? Because without you, we may have just admitted that it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Nick, you just you deflected. You haven't really spoke about your overall feelings about the novel. That's well, what I was trying to get to. <laughs> so it's funny. I uh, This is the last thing of hers I've read. I read everything else first. And including the second novel? Including the second novel, okay. her essays, uh, which if you get into uh, Mystery and Manners, it's basically like three essays, each repeated about four times. One's about the South, one's about teaching literature, and then one's about Catholicism, right? Um, so I kind of read all that stuff, and I was surprised at how much of this pulled from the short stories already, but I was also surprised at how kind of... I, I went between it sort of feeling edgy and raw and visceral because it is some of her earlier work and and a bit less polished between that and um actually like i said kind of kind of liking it right but i think ultimately i mean we unpacked a couple of short stories in previous podcasts and some of our other discussions those to me seem very obvious that that's her form that's her her three-act play on how to deconstruct moral stupidity right she's got that down to a science and this this feels like a bit of a, I don't know, a longer arc for her. And so I think I'm still a fan because I have this, I have my own background growing up in a religious household. And so this this idea here, uh, just from a standpoint of talking about religion in not this like hyper clean kind of way, coming at it from a different direction, actually kind of speaks to me in a way where I'm like, oh, I wish... I wish I sort of knew about that when I was younger because it's it's almost kind of punk rock in a way, right? She's she's taking on this thing, and I respect that. So that mentality, but from a from a work and craft standpoint, I, I will openly admit it's not not my favorite. Right, and we're also saying this within the context of her brilliant work. Right. So we're not saying in the context of whatever literature novels period. are on the shelf. We're saying in the world of Flannery O'Connor, uh, this is on the lower tier. Second but she's still better flawed. than everyone else. Second place for her is eighth yeah, place overall. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think that's important. And I would also say that writers just write the same story over and over again. Right, well, you know. Every writer has her own preoccupations her own things that are her center, the own things that she thinks about. 
and whether that writer is writing a young adult novel or a short story or a literary novel or a graphic novel, uh, those same themes will arise. Because if a writer is really writing from a deep and honest place, yeah, those preoccupations will be the same. Although you could argue that her focus even by that measure is pretty narrow, right? And that's sort of, to me, what is interesting about how much she was able to squeeze out of a certain arguably argument or belief system and then a certain place, for lack of a better description. It's amazing just in the the little bit that I've read how she's able to cover so much ground within this very narrow focus. Pre- preoccupation. Yeah, right? preoccupation. Good word. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I would say George Saunders, um, my personal hero, uh, it's similar with him, you know? His stories are about a little guy caught up in the machine of capitalism and in systems that are cruel to average people, but that story told with absurdity and humor. So that's the moral of this is learn to do one thing really well? Uh, I think it's you can't help but do one thing really well. And so I think, uh, you know, when we choose stories for an anthology, we choose the best version of the thing that the writer does over and over again. Which is why everyone reads A Good Man is Hard to Find or Revelation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. Yeah. Those are the hits. Yeah. Although, read more. Yeah. Although there's others. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would say if you're a deep fan of a musician, you should listen to all of their albums, Mm -hmm. right? But everyone has some hits, and there's a reason why the hits are hits, right? And I think part of it is also pleasure and delight. Like we have our same themes here, but with less of the humor and pleasure and delight. Yeah, there is an there is an impishness in in the later stories that I've read that's missing here from the whole of Wise Blood, right? It gets very ponderous and heavy handed. Whereas Revelation, despite its it has this of the same ingredients, it it stays light on its feet in a way that um, I missed in Wise Blood, right? And this was an early work, and she may not have recognized that humor was her gift, one of her many gifts. I think that sometimes people devalue what their biggest talents are because those talents come easily to them. And I think that humor is a talent that people often think of as not as important in literature. So... Or uh, any art form, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, right? it's true. Yeah, so Tobias Wolf uh, was a professor at Syracuse when George Saunders was a student there. And so George Saunders got into the program with his weird, hilarious stories. But then one time um, he was talking, George Saunders was talking to Tobias Wolf at a party. And George Saunders was like, hey, don't worry. I'm not doing that silly, weird stuff anymore. I'm writing serious stories. And <laughs> Tobias Wolf winked at him and it was and was like, just don't lose the magic. Uh, but then George Saunders said he lost the magic and he wrote this long, ponderous novel about a trip to Mexico where he tried to be fancy um, by instead of saying he sat on a chair He chose the most abstruse and strange language to say he sat on a chair. So it would be like he lowered his body onto the wooden square um, because he wanted to be deep and pretentious. So he worked on this and worked on this. And then when he finally showed it to his wife, she sat at the table and read it. And then um, he came into the room to check on her. And her head was just like slumped on the table. (laughs) 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 <laughs> because uh, she was disappointed that 
um, she had sacrificed her own time for him to complete this opus that did not reflect his strengths. Yeah, I, I think I've actually read one of like his essays covering that where he talks about all of these terrible Joycean words that he made up, mm -hmm. just jamming those things together to try to give it some level of, of art. Yeah. And knowing Tobias Wolf's work, you could see him just being like, oh, dude, you know, what are you doing? Right. I, I know. Um, so, so getting back to that original topic, the, uh, the eternal return of sorts, back to nihilism. So let's talk about some of the underlying philosophy in this and how it ties into either Nietzsche or other great works of literature. And so uh, a big tenet of nihilism for, for Nietzsche was basically kind of the absence of religion, right? Getting it back to getting it back to man. God is dead. Right. And there's, um, there's the popular idea of nihilism, which is sort of, I think, often confused with sort of hedonism and anarchy and, and stuff like that. But then there's actually sort of, if you read a lot of Nietzsche, it's, it's more centered on yourself, right? It's a little bit, it's honestly kind of libertarian in a way, right? It's very individual based. And so I wanted to read a little section from the Antichrist that I think fits well into the general um, the idea of Hazel Motes as a nihilist, right? And so Nietzsche goes on to say, What is good? Everything that heightens the feeling of power in man, the will to power, power itself. What is bad? Everything that is born of weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power is growing, the resistance is overcome. Not contentedness, but more power. Not peace, but war. Not virtue, but fitness. The weak and the failure shall perish. First principle of our love of man and they shall even be given every possible assistance. What is more harmful than vice? Active pity for all the failures and all the weak. Christianity. Dear God, he's describing Donald Trump. Yeah. Failure is the worst thing. The only value is getting more power. And you can see why a lot of his philosophy was warped in the mid-20th century for certain things. But so you have this, uh, you have Hazel Motes as certainly a nihilist, but almost kind of a failed nihilist in a way, right? Yeah. He couldn't hold to this level of idealism. And so how does, how does that line Thank up God. with... Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully neither can Donald Trump, right? But how, do, how does that fit in, in with, you know, this book, maybe other works of literature, the classic idea of nihilism as it pops up? Yeah. So Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky was written partially in response to Nietzsche. And that book concerns a man who is Raskolnikov, right? Mm -hmm. Who is obsessed with this idea of becoming Nietzsche's Superman, uh, a man superior and better to all men who is justified in doing whatever because he's so great. So anyway... Raskolnikov wants money, and so he murders a couple neighbors to get that money. Um, but then he has a nervous breakdown because it turns out he does have a moral center, which he cannot escape. Much like someone else we know in a mm -hmm. book we just read. It also, there's a, there's a funny quote in Wise Blood that's the, the that's the trouble with you intellectuals, Ani J muttered. <laughs> you don't never have nothing to show for what you're saying, right? And you know, Nietzsche poses this idea that we just talked about that O'Connor and Dostoevsky are basically saying, No way. Right? If this is the way we go, we're doomed. Right. right. And clearly they are right. Yeah. That led us to concentration camps. Yeah. Right. And I would say even now, people who believe there's no truth, they say that, but they don't really believe that there's no right and wrong. Because if there's no right and wrong, how can they say that putting kids in cages is wrong? Because, you know, modern intellectuals who are progressive are the people marching through the streets saying it's wrong to take away abortion rights. It's wrong to hate immigrants and use that to obtain power. We all believe in right and wrong. Um, just we say that we don't. So I would say the modern progressive uh, atheist 
um, is kind of like Hazel Moats. We really can't escape our moral mm-hmm. centers, and we do have them as much as we may deny them. Which ties in nicely with a children's book that I believe you were a oh, fan of. Oh, right. Yeah, Runaway Bunny. Um, <laughs> so there's a children's book called The Runaway Bunny, and it's about a bunny who says to his mother, I'm going to run away. Um, so he says... I'm going to run away and become a crocus in a hidden garden. And then his mother says, then I will become the gardener who tends to you. Um, He says, I will become uh, a fisherman and, you know, fish upon the ocean. And then his mom says, I will become the wind that blows you to shore. Um, And those are not the exact words. That's paraphrase. <laughs> you should definitely take the time, invest the time, and read the actual book. Uh, so the book is actually an allegory of the soul. So as much as you try to run from God, God will become whatever surrounds you in order to pursue you. And we can also tie that into uh, a poem an old poem called, uh, I think, The Hound of Heaven, which um, we could maybe read. Oh, by Francis Thompson. Thompson, uh, which maybe we should read the first few lines of. All right. So these are the first few lines of The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson, who lived from 1859 to 1907. I fled him. Down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the mist of tears. I hid from him and under running laughter of feasted hopes I sped and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasm fears. So I won't read the whole thing, but in the end, God gets him. <laughs> God wins every time. God wins every time. You can't keep a good God down. <laughs> uh, so perhaps since we have already kind of answered the question we normally answer, which is, is this of substance? And we have determined that it is, but perhaps not the lead Flannery O'Connor work. Maybe we'll end a question for Kathleen. So we've kind of tied back the fact that This story is linked to Crime and Punishment, The Runaway Bunny, and a classic poem. So for the reader, for these four works, what's the order that you recommend that they read them in out of priority and preference or for maximum philosophical? Same again. Same again. Okay. So we have The Runaway Bunny. We have the book at hand, Wise Blood. We have uh, the poem you just read, uh, Francis Thompson's The Hound of Heaven. And then, of course, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Okay. So let's consider the amount of time we have in this modern era. So start with The Runaway Bunny because you can also read it to your child or niece or nephew. Okay. Two birds, one stone. Doesn't take a lot of time. You could read. It. You could read The Hound of Heaven, but really the part I read, like, that's the main idea. So is that fourth place then? Um, No, I'd say second place because it doesn't take that much time. Just efficiency? Time, yeah. Okay. All right. right? Um, and then I would say Crime and Punishment. And then I would say this book. But if you're going to read Flannery O'Connor, I would read uh, both of her story collections first. And then I would read Mystery and Manners. And you could also read her letters. And then you could read Wise Blood. (laughs) (laughs) And there we have it. Well, Kathleen, thanks for joining any time, yeah. unless uh, a future time involves reading her other novel. <laughs> <laughs> we promise that will not be your next appearance. A nihilistic ending to a nihilistic start. <laughs> Kathleen Founds is the author of When Mystical Creatures Attack which won the 2014 University of Iowa Press John Simmons Short Fiction Award and was named a New York Times Notable Book. 
Her work has also appeared in The Sun, Good Housekeeping, The New Yorker Online, and Salon. You can find us online at booksofsomesubstance.com or Instagram and Twitter with the handle booksosubstance. Please take the time to rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you get your podcasts these days. Happy reading and happier nihilism.